All right, so lymphatic drainage. Um, in a intro massage program, uh, lymphatic drainage is taught for basic uh, uses like sprained ankles, uh, inflammation due to injuries, um, uh, things of that nature. Um, if you want to take more advanced lymphatic drainage, yes, ma'am. Can I record? Yes, I'm recording too, but you may oh. record. Oh. Let's all record. <laughs> Um, but you can take continuing ed classes and uh, even a certification program, either just in like the VODER, V-O-D-D-E-R method of lymphatic drainage and or complete decongestive therapy, which is another way to get the full package. And when you do more advanced, it's actually a good modality for um, medically necessary prescribed massage that's covered by insurance. So it's great for things like if uh, somebody has had a mastectomy and their um, cancer has metastasized to their axillary lymph nodes and they remove some of those lymph nodes, then there's going to be also some damage to the lymph tissue there. And so then they're going to be prone to some inflammation. It's great for lymphedema um, and other kind of swelling. But speaking of lymphedema and other kind of swelling, there can be different causes uh, to inflammation, and it can be kind of more advanced, you know, than an introduction. So we're not going to get into those treatments, but I am going to review the lymphatic system and how it works, both for your own knowledge and for the MBLEX. So the lymphatic system, if you recall, is a parallel system to the circulatory system. So you have all these lymphatic vessels going close to all of the capillary beds and then a lot of them are also close to the surface of the skin and so a refresher of what happens at the capillary beds is on the oxygen rich side of the little capillaries um, we have you know our little single file rbc's going through and we have a single layer of tissue here for better diffusion and obviously we want to get oxygen out to the tissues and carbon dioxide is going to come on back in so then at the other side of our capillary bed we're going to be more oxygen poor but what happens here in the capillary bed is that water also comes out you know the plasma and so with this fluid coming out, we're going to have blind end or one way dead end little lymphatics in this region as well. And they're going to pick up um, some of the water that uh, doesn't go back into the capillaries. So approximately 90% of the water via plasma is going to go right back in the capillaries, but about 10% of it is just hanging out in the interstitial space and needs to be picked up by the capillaries. And so this portion that needs to be picked up by the lymph, uh, ca uh, the lymph vessels is called the obligatory load, and it's about 10%. And this is a brilliant design because we're always taking some of the fluid out and then always filtering it. So the part you probably hear the most about of the lymph system is the lymph node. So where are the lymph nodes located? All over. All over your body. They are all over, good. And I also see people pointing to the axillary region and around the throat and um, suboccipitals and inguinals. So they're also in the popliteal areas and in the, um, the joints of the, um, elbow as well. Are there some in your wrist? I mean, your, your ankle? Yes, yeah. Okay, but so, not a lot, right? Right, right. So the, the biggest groupings are in your axillary and inguinal, um, but also all your joints and, and around here. So when this fluid gets picked up um, by the lymphatic vessels, it's going to travel up towards the lymphatic ducts. Um, where it's then going to get dumped back into the back into the circulatory system, um, 
and along the way it's going to go through those lymph nodes. So what are the lymph nodes doing? What are they? Yes. Passageways, yeah, yeah. The passageways are kind of, you know, more of these lymphatics, but this is good thinking. And then along the way in our joints, you know, we have these little capsules, if you will. What, what do you think they're about? Um, well, the lymph nodes themselves are looking for pathogens and destroying the pathogens also. Excellent. Excellent. So the actual design is more complicated than the image I'm going to put in your, your mind to think about, but they're literal physical filters. Um, so like that kind of um, connective tissue that's like spider webby or like a cotton ball to little, literally trap particles. But then of course the immune system also uh, attacking the bacteria and viruses and um, particulate within there exactly and part of what's more complicated about this design than the, than the simple way i'm describing it is you actually have more going in more of the um the tubes or the lymph uh vessels mm -hmm. than coming out and part of what that does is it it changes the the pressure system in here which just also helps with the filtering but it's a uh, part of, of course, then our immune system, this, this filtering. So questions so far? So if it's moving the visual on its own, where are we moving it? Like it has to be entering and out? Or? That's an awesome question. Yeah, it, so. The inflammation of that thing down. Yeah, yeah, great question. So when it's doing a good job all by itself, it doesn't really need any help right? It's, it's moving along like it should. But there are certain times when either there's a problem with the flow in the vessels itself, or there's too much fluid and the, you know, exudate or fluid coming out. And so there's kind of more of a load than usual. Um, and so there can be kind of different problems causing it. At our simplistic level, helping with sprained ankles and so forth, um, we're basically helping when there's an inflammatory situation and there's more, there's more fluid happening. So we can actually help speed the fluid along as well as help more fluid go in to be picked up. So to take a little bit closer look at, at how, you know, these vessels are and how we can speed things up, they're kind of broken up into kind of functional units called lymphangians. And what people didn't use to talk about much before, but we know now, is that they actually have a little bit of a pumping mechanism in them. And so we could actually help speed up the pumping mechanism. Uh, the lymph vessels to help move fluid along also rely on the pumping of the muscles around them. And because they're nearby, just that movement helps push them. So to understand that, because they don't have like the pumping of the heart, like the arteries do, and we're often going against gravity, right? Like picture you've got this lymph fluid down in your toes that has to get all the way up to here. Was that what you made first and then make it back to? Yes, okay. yes, yeah. So. Up in the upper body, they've got to make it back up to here. And we call that the terminus, um, up in the lymph ducts. And up in the, lo in the lower body, they have to get to the thoracic duct in the center. Yeah, I'm going to show you that. Show yeah. That again. Why don't you pass around this picture while we talk about it more. So both of the, um, the lymph, uh, if you focus on the lymphatic ducts and the thoracic ducts, um, yeah, I think that's a, and, and then this muscle picture, that'd be a great start. So as we're picturing this going against gravity and they don't have a lot of pumping motion, you have to also um, understand that the lymph uh, vessels have one-way valves. So very similar to the veins, 
if they travel, if the lymph is able to travel up, it's not going to travel back down because of the one way valve. Excellent. And yeah, it's easier to go with gravity. Of course. So you're helping it go down with gravity. And then because of the one way valves, if you move it, can't they go back. Say, up. Um, higher than the level of the heart. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So as Elizabeth is passing around that picture, um, take a look at the interesting drainage pattern that the right side of your head, shoulder, and right arm all drain in the right uh, duct, but the rest of your whole body drains on the other side. So it's, I don't know why it's imbalanced like that, it just is. Um, we're only going to focus on ankles, um, like sprained ankles or, or uh, inflammation in the wrists. But if you were to do other lymphatic drainage, one of the most important things is to look at the flow of the lymph and what direction it wants to go so that you know which direction to help move the lymph. And then sometimes there'll be some missing lymph nodes or some missing lymphatics. And then you need to know what the anastomoses are, which is just like a detour. So like what's the other way that you can help move the lymph if the primary route is, is, is blocked? Questions so far? All right, thanks Elizabeth. All right, so we've got our lymph angions, our one-way valves, our anastomoses, and now let's just look at a basic sprain. So inflammation, um, is there's, there can be different causes for it. Um, and so we want to talk about like the basic kind of sprained ankle situation. And it's actually more complicated than this, but the basic kind of idea is that your body is creating this inflammation to sort of wall off a certain area of the body where there's an injury so that if there was a break in the skin, you could wall off the area where bacteria would come in. So if you picture like you step on a rusty nail and you don't want whatever's on there coming into the rest of your body. And so your body's gonna inflame and wall off that area and then mount an immune system attack. Now that's certainly not the only purpose of inflammation. But your body's going to do that, you know, whether or not there actually was a break. So if you had a foreign object cut your body open, there is a huge risk for infection. And so that, yeah, that's a great defense mechanism. But if there was no cut, let's say you just twisted your ankle funny, it's almost like your body is overreacting. And you can remove the inflammation early, minimize it, and increase the healing speed. I will say, however, with a huge caveat, and that is it does serve a very good uh, purpose of limiting your mobility so that you don't overdo it. So, you know, there might be all kind of soft tissue damage in there, ligaments, tendons, muscles, etc. And if, you know, you've got pain and inflammation, that's a good signal from your body that you shouldn't overdo it right now. And so you do run the risk, honestly, if you minimize that, that someone might actually overtrain and overdo it too soon, you know. But having said that, there definitely can be some benefit of moving that inflammation along and speeding along the process. Questions, comments, personal application, additions, no, interpretive you. dances. <laughs> Um, we got one. It just takes them longer too. <laughs> She's um, still doing it. <laughs> oh, a lymphatic dance. All right. But some people, it takes them much longer to just naturally become unswollen or, or that inflammation to go away. Yep. Yep. And so it's good, yeah, to, to speed that along. Yeah, for sure. I don't want to 
I don't want to uh, minimize the benefit of decreasing inflammation. I do think it's just worth putting it out there that people will definitely, some people will try to get back to their activities too quickly. But I personally um, turn to professional sports and Olympic athletes and think if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. So if that's what they're going to do on the football field to help people recover quickly or the Olympic athletes, then heck, I'm going to try it too, right? <laughs> right? Clearly, they know what they're doing. Um, so, all right. So that's the, the basic theory behind it. Do you want any more information about the system itself? All right, so let's talk about the techniques which are simple and I will try to keep it very fast so we can get to our demo and get to our massage. So there's only a few techniques here and they're all really easy. Um, but again, it's the understanding of sequence and when to do it, when not to do it. Um, that we're not going to rush into like doing lymphatic drainage for more complicated situations. I'm going to give you one example and then I'll move on. You could have underlying issues with the kidneys, with the heart. You could have too much liquid in there, for example, in the interstitial spaces if you had a variety of reasons why proteins were getting out. And those giant protein molecules that end up having these little positive and negative parts sticking out act as magnets. And so what gets attracted to those magnets? I bet the answer is water. Yeah, yeah. So then you could end up with more water that needs to come out, right? And so there's just... Drying it out, literally. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Just like a salty bath, right? You know, sucking out your... Yeah. So just an example that there's other reasons why this could be happening. And so we don't want to kind of get beyond ourselves. All right, but for a simple sprain, uh, you already know a lot of this, right? What's your basic first aid for an acute injury with inflammation? Ice. 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 Rest. Ice. Compression. E. You said it earlier. You said something elevation. to elevation. Elevation, right? So the traditional um, initial for that that people use often is rice, rest, ice, compress, and elevate. Sometimes people add a P to that for price. Any guess what the P stands for? I'm sorry, what? Good guess. Protect. Protect. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you will have a surprising number of people hobble into your office on crutches and little wheelie things, and they may or may not want help with that. They may just want their normal massage and just be like, yeah, I also did this, but whatever. But a lot of times, of course, when they're on crutches or whatever um, compensatory thing they're having to do, you can also pay attention to, okay, now their neck and shoulders are all jacked up from the crutches and, and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, we are going to apply, if they have a sprained ankle, we can at least elevate it, as Jill mentioned, above the heart. And so the whole time they're prone, you can just have enough pillows to get their ankle up. And so general guideline is you wanna have their foot and ankle higher than their knee, which is higher than their hip. So you can build them a little tower of pillows. And today we have a body cushion support system in there that people most often use for prone position for support of breast, abdomen, et cetera. But it has some nice big flexible parts that are washable so that we can use the good medical grade cleaner on it and not worry about it like a pillow. If you do use a pillow, you can use a hospital pillow that already has the vinyl covering or you can buy the coverings to put on them so that you can clean them properly. Questions so far? Your office may or may not have ice, but you can also ice for sure. That is in your scope of practice. 
for some reason, massage therapists tend to use heat more than ice. Um, but maybe it's because most people don't enjoy ice. It doesn't feel as good as heat. But of course, you want to use ice or contrast therapy when it's appropriate. Obviously, we don't want to use heat when there's inflammation. Questions so far? I don't know how like any of my symptoms work, but like this whole time in my body is just hurting and I went into that and like the river I just like water. Ooh, so when nice. I got out, I so much better. Oh that sounds so good. Mm -hmm. I yeah. had to be patient so I was freezing. <laughs> but after a while I was like, okay, I can sit in this now. That's really awesome. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. That reminds me. <laughs> like my stomach down was in the river. That's and nice. Then, yeah, it can feel brutal at first, but so good. Oh, yeah. yeah, I um, I do that when I'm running sometimes after a long run is just freeze, you know, my feet, my ankles as much as I can tolerate. Yeah. Sometimes I'll even do that with my arms. I'll fill up the sink with cold water and a little bit of ice, and then I can put. Oh yeah. Put so my good. Up so I can watch YouTube. Yeah. And then rest my arms in the kitchen sink so that I can. I can um, reduce that inflammation if it starts getting too much. That's awesome. Yeah. Love it. Okay, so as for the actual techniques and the order that you do them in, this first point I've seen on a lot of practice MBLAX uh, questions, the first thing you want to do is called clear the terminus. And what that means is the terminus is up here where the lymph is going to get dumped back into the lymphatic vessels and back into the subclavian vein. And so it's right above the clavicle, and you're going to go towards the medial direction with the first technique that I'm going to teach you. And basically, you're stretching the skin and letting it spring back without coming off the body. Stretch, spring, pause, stretch, spring, pause, stretch, spring, pause, about five to ten times. However many fingers or uh, area of your hand you use is basically dependent on what part of the body you're at. Now you're only moving the superficial skin. You're not doing anything deep right there. And in fact, they say, and it's probably true, although I haven't read the research papers myself, that these little lymphatic vessels um, collapse really easily. And so any deep massage techniques will collapse them for approximately 10 minutes or so. So you want to do, if you're going to do this lymphatic drainage, do it before your deep work or do something else for quite a while before you come back. So first thing, we're going to clear the terminus. Now that same very simple skin stretching technique is the primary technique. Wherever you're going to do it, you're going to stretch in the direction basically of the next nodes, which is you know towards the heart basically or towards the terminus, you're gonna stretch, let the skin spring back and pause. And it's a little half circle motion and then pause, that spring and then pause. I'll draw a little picture of it. So you're stretching, um, you're stretching up you're letting it spring back, and then you're pausing. So again, depending on what part of the body you're on, you may use like a whole hand gently, or you may use a few fingers, and you're going to repeat that about five to seven times. Now the order here is really important. We want to clear the area closer to the next lymph nodes, proximally, before we clear distally but we're going towards the heart. So we're going towards the terminus, but we're clearing proximally before we clear distally. And if there's an inflammation, we never work on it or distal to it. So pretend this is my ankle, we are only working proximal to the swelling, not locally or not distally. Questions, comments? Is that your doctor located here? Are you always working upward in that manner, no matter what part of the body you're working? If anywhere from here down, yes. So you're always working from pretty much like top to bottom, but like you're 
you're not starting all the way from the bottom. It's like here to here, there to there. Exactly. You're always working up. Exactly. Well, just if you're actually clearing, you know, the neck or the face, you're going to go to these uh, vessels. So well, they're the only one because it's above the gut. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going up. You're still going to clear them first. Both yep. or, or just? Both. Yeah, just clear them both. And most chapters, uh, including our anatomy book, have a really good map. If you're going to do any kind of lymphatic drainage, I can't believe this one does not have a good map. Our anatomy book does. Um, I'll copy that for the next class. What you need is a good map that just shows you the arrows because while it's generally just up, there are a few places where you're actually going backwards um, to the next spot. Or occasionally when you need the anastomoses, and you need to divert in a different direction. So practice that on yourself. And probably the trickiest part is to go so lightly that all you're doing is moving the skin. And then you don't want to come off. You're just letting it spring back. And then you pause. And you're going gentle enough that you don't squish the little lymphatic. Now, I think one of our books says something about it's enough pressure to just move the skin just yeah yeah so practice you know on yourself in different places like how do you just move the skin yeah and then the next lymphatic technique is even more gentle. It's a light effleurage, which is called feathering. And you're just super light stroking, again, towards the nodes. And again, we're not going to go local or distal to the swelling. So tr you, you read about this as, as doing this till you feel a texture change. And I've read about that texture change called silky. And Elizabeth feels it as a sort of a waxy. Yeah, OK. Yeah, so you go for that change. And if you don't feel that change, you just do it a while. Two more techniques. Uh, one of them is with all of those lymph nodes at joint, you want to pump the joints. It doesn't really honestly matter whether that's active, passive, or active assisted. So if you support the client and you move the joint for them, that's called uh, passive. If they move the joint themselves, that's called active. And if you assist them, you can have an active assisted. Now, all of the joints have some lymph nodes. So think about just the pumping motions at the different joints. If we're talking about our ankle swelling, while not hurting the injured ankle, of course, we want to do some flexion here because of the um, inguinal nodes. Yeah, inguinal nodes. So we're flexing them. You can even get some crossing there, just really pump, release, pump, release. Same with the knee, pumping and releasing. If they have inflammation at the ankle, we are obviously not doing range of motion there. But Yes, it's very light work. And Elizabeth was sharing a good treatment recommendation. It is actually, I find, challenging to do light work the whole time. And so you want to really get comfortable, like sit down, get in a good position where it's easy for you to do that. I think sitting down is a bit easier because you're not towering over the person where you can try to pressure. Yeah. You can also like rest your elbows on the table and then just, you can even use your whole body if it's starting to feel Line like taxing. You can just do those little motions while, you know, trying to rest your arms as much as you can. Because you're going to be there for a little while because it's a, it's a slow and light technique. So you've got to get comfortable as much as possible. Otherwise, you're just going to be holding the arms up. Yeah, and we've talked about the main application of sprains. I'm going to pause. And so our last technique, using the cistern of Kylie. 
Cisterna Kylie. Uh, I'll, I'll put the spelling on the board. C-H-Y-L-I, two I's, one I. I think it's a two I. All right. And I think it might be C-I-S. Oh, C-I-S. Pardon me. Thank you for looking it up. Yep. C-I-S. So, thank you. C-I-S. So um, for that move, you're basically um, with a little bit of pressure below the solar plexus. You're basically going to have the client do little tiny mini crunches. Not sitting up far, just a little rolling. That looks perfect. Yeah. And so part of what you're doing here is that part of what drives the limp in the thoracic area is, is a pressure change. And we've got our deepest lymphatic in, in this area. So we want to kind of drive that pressure change. Yeah. So. Those are the basic techniques. Um, are there any questions? So that's fine for all days without being like Yes, if you're just doing it for like a sprained ankle or a little swelling on the wrist, um, actually even face stuff. So if somebody's just like puffy, they've been crying or they're you know puffy for whatever reason and they want to look good for a day or. So it's the same basic techniques, but there's you have to study the pattern of which way to push the limb. And I can give you diagrams and put it in the module of just which way you want to take those little movements. Um, and you're going to, you know, the ears and submandibular and suboccipital. And so the same kind of skin stretchy techniques, but you're you're going in a little micro pattern. And it is often taught, and this is how I usually teach it, if you practice one side, you can look and your client can look at the difference because it's pretty cool, and then fix them and do the other side. I personally love using little baby cups for it, and then I'll uh, entertain your question, but little baby glass cups, like the suction cups, not the big ones that can leave bruises, and they have a little um, squeezy thing on them, and you go in the order of the limp, and it does a great job. It's very cool. Question? Bags under the eyes. Yep, yep, yep. And that doesn't take too long either, right? It's a, it's a lovely, easy treatment. Um, you're just sitting at the head of the table, their face up very easy to do and so you could even do it as like an add-on service a lot of people would enjoy that that's right that's right and, and yeah and they make some really nice little tiny glass ones which is what i would recommend because the plastic ones can have kind of a rough edge for the face yeah um other you want to add something uh, the only thing that I would add in addition to the, you know, possible injuries is that a lot of people swell up in the summer or if they've been sitting for a long time or, um, like, I swell, my ankles swell when I fly. Um, so I get, you know, some people coming back from trips who just need a little help with their um, edema in their ankles. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. You spoke about the compression socks in the previous class. Do you want to talk about that again? Yes. Yeah. So um, just so it doesn't throw you, if you haven't um, seen the compression garments that people wear for um, edema in their arms or legs, don't be surprised if, um, if somebody comes in wearing them. They're pretty common, especially, um, especially in older men, I think. Um, because uh, congestive heart failure can make your legs swell really badly. Um, so uh, sometimes they're like prescription uh, compression garments, which are really difficult to get on and off, um, and they stay on all day long. Um, and then some of them are just the ones that you can order on Amazon or find in the pharmacy or whatever that you can just slip on, and those are a little bit easier to remove. Um, I usually don't recommend that they take those off just because it takes so long um, and it can be pretty difficult. Um, but 
if you wanted to work like above their compression thermos, that would be cool. I totally agree with that. I, I wouldn't take them off either. They're hard to get on and off. It would take a lot of your massage and they would most often be worn by folks like the elderly who already have thin, frail skin and who already have mobility issues. So it's not something you want to rush trying to get those on and off. Um, so, yeah. Other questions or comments? Yep. Especially at certain times of the year when most people have allergy stuff going on, if you are doing some of that, especially, you know how all of your meat gets swollen and stuff? Does that help with drainage or just does it not really affect that? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I haven't. Um, you know, read any books or seen anybody like talk about it in link videos as being a thing. Yeah, and yet I have seen an experience, you know, when that stuffiness occurs, it can be helpful to drain it. And even you'll notice just even working people's tight SCMs, and whether they have paniculoses, the little crunchies and or trigger points, a lot of times it creates that kind of um, stuffy headed feeling even as you're releasing it. And they'll even feel like fluid in their ears. It's very interesting. Yeah, I have I have one uh, client who's older. Every time we work on her neck, her ears pop and she can hear so much better. And so that's kind of that's kind of our like signal that we've done, you know, a great job on her neck when her ears finally pop. And I do find a little drainage in that situation is helpful. Again, just clearing the terminus and then working your way down. And I'll get you the maps of the face so that you just know the right direction to push things in the neck and the face. It's, it's not quite lymphatic drainage. Yes. It's not quite lymphatic drainage, but sort of. If I have a cold and I have, you know, my lymph nodes are swollen, lots of times I'll lay with some heat on my neck there and that seems to really help things I'll drain yeah. yeah so you could even like clear the terminus here and do a little bit of heat I find that that helps a lot that's like one of the only things that is really consistently helpful for me yeah yeah okay. nice and in the time of covid while our clients are wearing masks we're a little bit limited in, in which parts we can reach because we don't want to remove their mask but there's still quite a bit uh, we can get to for the drainage, in, including the parts around the eyes, um, with very careful attention to your to your hands. Um, so, yeah. Oh, one thing I didn't mention in the class before: uh, occasionally I'll be teaching someone how to do lymphatic drainage to themselves, and so we go over the whole routine of moving the skin, the whole the whole thing just like we taught you. Um, and sometimes that can be a little bit overwhelming for people. So, and especially if they're older and like bending down to be able to get to their legs is, um, is difficult. Lots of times I will um, recommend getting one of those like super soft body brushes that has, you know, like um, the little hair brushes for cradle cap for babies that is like the really, really super soft ones. You can get those body brushes and sometimes they'll have a long handle on them. And as long as you're not pressing too hard, you can use it in a similar manner to do it to yourself all the way down to your ankle. Um, and I've recommended that to several people just because they want to be able to do it at home. But the technique and the skin thing just is really um, overwhelming or confusing. So I just recommend the body brush and that makes a lot of sense. It's easy to do. Yeah, that's an awesome idea. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. And they make them, they make them for lotion for the back. And in fact, they make the sticks actually to help people get their compression socks on. You know, it's good to understand and respect people's mobility issues and impairments and modify, right? Not um, give them like the advanced yoga stretches 
but keeping in mind, you know, their mobility. And in this case, that's a great, uh, a great recommendation. Um, so we, you kind of went right into the kind of modified version. We should mention that this is such an easy thing to do, that it's a great one to teach your clients because it's not like a permanent fix. So some people will have some drainage issues where it's just something they need to do on a regular basis. And so you can, you teach them that self-care. Any other questions? So how often do you do that? That's a good question. Um, I am not an expert in it, but I would um, think not more than like once a day because it's kind of a lot for your body to process and you're really kind of speeding things along. What would you say? I, yeah, I'd say no more than once a day. Um, and also I brought this up to the other classes that um, especially if you're moving a lot of fluid, if they have, you know, their ankles are really swollen or it's like, I would say moderate to severe, they will probably have to pee really bad mm -hmm. by the time that you're done. So I always like warn people ahead of time that it might make them have to pee and that if you have to like pause halfway through for them to run to the bathroom, that's totally normal and expected. Um, usually nobody has to do that, but I usually give that warning just in case. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't do it more than once a day. I I feel like that would be that you'd start to feel a little bit crummy, kind of like when you get too many massages um, and you get that like hangover feeling. Yeah. I understand moving the liquid in the body upwards, but you're not supposed to work anything beneath what's actually swollen. How are you moving the swelling? Is that supposed to move on its own when you free up? Yeah, that kind of helps. Uh, it gives it somewhere to go, and you're creating like a, a pulling motion by all of this moving better. So, and and you know, if the swelling's here, you can be right above it, right, right proximal to it. So that's still helping this clear up. Okay. Yeah. But if they have just edema from just regular ankle swelling, like they look at the grocery store and they're on the street all the time and you can get that swelling in your lower leg. Not an injury. If it's not an injury, you can go all the way down to their toes and, and bring it up that way. But if there's an injury, if it's protecting something, then you don't want to go to that. Yeah, but again, it could have different underlying issues. So it's a good thing to make sure they understand that their doctor, you know, if there's something going on with kidney, heart, etc. Yeah. Um, anything else? I think that about covers it. Um, I just recommend that you practice some because even though it's an easy technique, it just takes a little uh, practice. Um, and yeah, that's it.